So good morning. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about ill conditioning in, in FWI and a very simple diagonal approximation to the Hessian that we can use that's better than what we've been using until now uh, that gives us improved results. Okay, so first I'm going to talk about uh, why conditioning is important, uh, especially for descent solvers. I'm going to demonstrate uh, some poor conditioning effects of the FWI problem, talk about how we can construct uh, elements of a preconditioner, and then how to include receiver location distribution information uh, to further improve that. And I'll follow it up with an example. So ill conditioning in descent methods uh, is important for, as we can see on the left here. So we have a very simple two-parameter quadratic minimization problem, and the black path, oh, Hang on, that's not right. Laser pointer, yes. So the black path here shows the path taken by a very simple steepest descent solver. As we can see, the root of the problem is that the gradient direction at almost every point in this diagram does not point towards the minimum of the diagram. The strongest components of the gradient, so the, the model update directions which most quickly affect the functional tend to be overcorrected, and those which affect the, the functional more gradually are undercorrected. And in general, we actually might want that to be the other way around, as in this case. So we want to make a bigger update in this direction than we do in this direction, but the gradient tells us to do the opposite. So as a result, we zigzag slowly down this valley. And this is very analogous to what Henry was saying in his previous talk uh, with the balance between epsilon and velocity updates. So we can see this in FWI by looking at successive gradients as we iterate. So this is a very simple inversion of a Marmuzi, smooth Marmuzi model. And you can see that standing from a long way away, each gradient seems to be the opposite sign of the one before. That's actually only true in the shallow. And so the deeper part of the gradient is actually consistent between these iterations. And so going back to our previous diagram, we can see this is quite analogous to zigzagging down the valley. The, sh uh, the shallower part of the model affects the functional much more quickly than the deeper part of the model, and so we tend to overcorrect it on every iteration. This imbalance isn't limited to deep and shallow. Uh, it can be limited uh, any other sort of directions of model update that have a relatively small impact on the functional but aren't necessarily insignificant to the result that we want. So this can be high wave, relatively high wave numbers in the model that are, we're still sampling with low acoustic frequencies. And in the work that I'm pursuing more recently, the balance between how macro model updates affect the functional due to reflected arrivals. So going back to this diagram, what we need to understand to compensate for this is the curvature of these contours. And that's described by how the gradient changes as we move around. And that, in turn, is the matrix of second derivatives, which is the Hessian. And it turns out that to get the perfect, in the quadratic case, step direction, we need to apply the inverse Hessian to the gradient. But obtaining and inverting the Hessian, let alone, or well, obtaining it is expensive, let alone inverting it, uh, is prohibitively expensive. So we need to use an approximation instead. And so a popular approximation to use for the Hessian is to simply obtain the diagonal. And the red line shows the path that we take when we precondition this two-parameter problem with a diagonal Hessian. So to motivate you through the tiny bit of maths that I'm uh, going to go through next, uh, we'll show the result that I'll present later. This is a starting model for the Chevron uh, blind test that Dimitri presented this morning. And this is with the preconditioner, the, a naively constructed preconditioner, and this is with a preconditioner including receiver position information. And I'll come back to that result and talk about it more in a moment. Okay, so to obtain elements of the Hessian, uh, we can use this formula derived for the very simple uh, construction of FWI described down here. So I'm going to leave this up on the screen. You don't need to remember this but we're using the simplest possible FWI functional of a half of the squared sum of the residuals. And this is the expression I'd like you to sort of look at, and we're going to go through that in a moment. So what does this actually mean? Uh, if we want to obtain diagonal elements of the Hessian with this, what do we need to actually do? So we need to sample the wave. I should note there's actually a second term here, which I'm ignoring, which a lot of people ignore, because it's not always positive definite, uh, and it varies with the residual. So. This is focusing on the so-called Gauss-Newton component of the Hessian. So if we have the forward wave field that we've uh, obtained from solving the wave equation here, AU equals S, what do we need to do to obtain the scaling required uh, for a model, given model parameter I? We actually need to sample the wave field at that location, I. Uh, it's actually the second derivative of the wave field in general. Um, it's 
how the, the wave equation matrix depends on that model parameter. Then we need to treat that when we apply a to the minus one to a given uh, wave, uh, wave field effectively, we're treating that wave field as a source. And this is a localized source at the model parameter i. So we then propagate that and then we sample it at the receivers. This is what our picking matrix uh, earlier called P is doing. And then we have to re-inject that. And remember this is done for every single model parameter. Re-inject that at the receivers and propagate it backwards. And then we once again sample that at location I. And then we correlate that with the Ford wave field. Obviously this is prohibitively expensive. We have of the order of 100 million, possible, or a million to 100 million model parameters. And we simply can't afford to do two wave field propagations for every single one of them. So how do we get around this? Uh, a surprisingly popular choice is to ignore it. And this actually works quite well and is the origin of the result that I showed on the left earlier. So we use our forward wave field amplitudes to scale our gradient update directions uh, as a kind of preconditioner. But going back to the uh, original expression, I think we can do better than that. If we take, away, uh, take a source at i and propagate it to each receiver uh, in turn and then re-inject that and propagate it back to i, and it's important to note that a to the minus t is backwards propagation in time. Uh, I've been a bit casual with adjoints here. I've used them as transposers because in the time domain we're talking all these matrices are real. But as a result of the forward and then backward propagation, uh, all of the kinematic time delay effects of this cancel out. And we're just left with the amplitude effect of propagating from I to each receiver and then back to I. And so we can actually replace this with an approximation of the Green's function for a uniform background velocity model, which is simply one over the, one over the distance between the model point and the receiver point, summed over all the receivers. So this leaves us with this expression here, which is obviously much cheaper than calculating wave propagations. Well, I say obviously, but we can have a lot of receivers. So this calculation cost here is now the number of model parameters times the number of receivers, which can be sort of a million times of the order of 10,000. And that leaves us with something similar in cost to a wave equation solved. So now we need to figure out a way to calculate this cheaply. And the key to that is to make the observation that from a long way away, a group of receivers acts contributes to this sum in a very similar way. So we can approximate a group of n receivers a long way away as simply n over r squared in this summation. We actually use a better approximation than that, uh, but for the purposes of explaining how it's working, let's say we do that. So we can exploit this to calculate the sum cheaply. And so what we need to do is use the multipole expansion, which is often used in many body problems, to group nearby receivers into little clusters. And so I've made a, a simple example here with five receivers. These are denoted by the leaves of this tree. So you can imagine a 2D model with a receiver at x equals 30, 40, 50, 60, and 70. And so we build a tree of the receivers. And in, in general, this is a KD tree. But in this problem, all the receivers have the same depth. So we can easily display it. And we divide the receivers at each level of the tree into two groups that are localized in space. And we repeat this until the leaves of the tree uh, single receivers. Each of these tree nodes then represents an approximation of the group of receivers below it, which is valid if you're sufficiently far away from all of those receivers. And so we can see how we can then construct the preconditioner in this picture here. So starting here, we have our approximation of all the five receivers, which is invalid inside this black box because we're too close to them. So we can calculate the summation very cheaply for this bottom section of the model here. To calculate the approximation inside this box, we need then to use a smaller group of receivers on the left and of the right arm of the tree. And so following down this left-hand side, the next approximation is for these two receivers, and it's valid in all this region here, but not in the region very close to them. And then we have to branch recurse further down the tree and use the perfect uh, non-approximated solution for the individual receivers, but only for the space very near them. So this speeds up the process dramatically. So it's now much, much faster than a wave equation solve, and we can afford to do it every iteration. So going to show some quick results now. Uh, I'm going to use the same synthetic uh, that Dimitri showed you this morning. Uh, he's already discussed all of the uh, 
the details of it, so I'll skip over that. But I should say that the provided starting model is cycle skipped at the lowest usable frequency. Uh, Mike will talk uh, later on this afternoon about techniques for overcoming cycle skipping. That's not what the subject of this talk is. So for this demonstration, I'm going to use a starting model based on Mike's work earlier. So it's a smooth version of the output of adaptive waveform inversion. This model is not cycle skipped at the, the frequency I'm inverting for. And so after 15 and 40 iterations, without using this extra factor based on the receiver locations, these are the results we get. And then if we add the extra factor into our preconditioning, we get this. And so you can see it's denoted much sharper, these interfaces here, the amplitudes of this low velocity anomaly and the whole low velocity zone are much improved. And we get a much clearer structure in the deep. It's not just a simple balance between the deep and the shallow though. Uh, we haven't optimized the result in the deep at the expense of the shallow. We've actually recovered the shallow just as well, if not better. As you can see, uh, it's a bit hard to see on this screen actually. And a zoomed in version of these results in this box is shown on this next slide. So this is using source, uh, using forward wave field preconditioning only and incorporating the receiver locations into the Hessian. So preconditioning in the model space can have, as shown, a, a relatively big effect on the quality of the result. Uh, and receiver distribution information can be very cheaply included uh, in a simple preconditioner. And these results don't show it, but this is still worthwhile, uh, even when using higher order methods or conjugate gradients. Uh, finally, I'd like to thank all the sponsors of the meeting here, uh, Chevron for the test data set, and uh, the Full Wave Consortium for funding my research.